Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Christina Tallens, and I'm the Director of Modern Slavery Risk Assessments at the Wilberforce Institute here at the University of Hull. So I'm delighted to welcome you to our seventh webinar, which is hosted by us at the Wilberforce Business Academy. So in today's presentation, we're going to be talking about social auditing, the ETI base code, and how this can be used to monitor labor and human rights in supply chains. So um, some of you may know this and some of you may not, but there has been a lot of recent legislation, such as the Modern Slavery Act in the UK, or the EU Corporate Directive on Sustainability Reporting, which is focused on due diligence in supply chains. So this actually makes it a requirement for companies to monitor labor and human rights and to, walk, to work towards ensuring that decent living and working conditions are there for the people that give us our products and services. So a social audit is one tool in the due diligence approach. And I really want to emphasize that it's one tool, but it does provide us with some uh, information that can help us identify risks in a sector or in a region. So with that in mind, over the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to be looking at the social audit process, covering the ETI base code and look at how it's being used by companies to ensure that they're doing their due diligence. Um, I would like to point out that my presentation is being recorded, um, but we will stop the recording before we come to your questions at the end. So during my presentation, you can all see that you'll have a small chat box at the bottom of your screens. You, you can send in your questions by all means, and uh, we can come to them at the end. And um, at, at the end of the presentation, we can go into those in greater detail, or we can have about 15 minutes for us to have a discussion or exchange ideas or questions or best practices. Practice. So I'm really happy to start a discussion with the group afterwards. So given that we've got a few people here today, uh, we may not be able to go through all of your questions, but any questions that we don't get through, I can come back to you via email or privately. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get on. So as I said, uh, today we'll be going to be talking about social auditing, the ETA base code and uh, monitoring supply chains. So for those of, the, of you that don't know us, the Wilberforce Institute is actually a research center. We were founded in 2006 and we have an interdisciplinary team uh, with staff that come across from uh, the legal departments, the social sciences and education. I'm actually a practitioner, I'm not an academic here. So I spend a lot of my time uh, visiting uh, sites. Um, we've all had direct experience of dealing with forced labor or debt bondage, trafficking and smuggling in supply chains so we have a lot of um we have a lot of experience to draw on when it comes to uh dealing with issues and our risk assessment services were actually set up with um this in mind we were set up in 2014 to try to help businesses uh address modern slavery because it's a very complex issue My background, well, I've already said, I'm Director of Risk Assessment Services here at the Wilberforce Institute. I also did some work for Anti-Slavery International and then the French equivalent, the Comité contre l'esclavage moderne in, in uh, France and Spain and Italy. I am a trained social auditor, uh, so I've been trained by Intertech and I've had lots of witnessed audits. I think I must have done about 100 audits now and I'm now uh, moving on to modern slavery risk assessments, but I've worked with the big firms like SGS and Intertech and Impact Limited. I was a consultant on the UN Global Programme Against Trafficking and Smuggling of Human Beings um, back when the protocol was being developed in the year 2000. And I have worked for a big commodities company and sat in the in the procurement department. So as part of that function, I sat along the um, in the working groups that the Ethical Trading Initiative run. And I've, I've worked with several retailers and international brands. So why should we be looking at social audits and the ETI base code? Well, um, it might be that you are in the UK or in Europe or even in the US and your clients may be asking you uh, for a social audit so that they can check uh, how you're managing your workforce. Um, so they might it might be actually a requirement from one of your uh, clients. Secondly, it's a, it's a good way to understand labor and human rights practices on the ground. A, a social audit is like a spot check in time, but it does give you an indication about what is going on within a sector or within a region or within suppliers of a certain product. 
Thirdly, the ETI base code uh, is increasingly used as a benchmark for international stand uh, as a benchmark international standard. You'll hear a lot of people talking about international labor organization conventions, and the ETI base code takes 10 of those and puts them in a very simple format. And then fourthly, uh, you should be looking to actively manage the risks in your own supply chains and help, you know, it will help you improve uh, conditions for workers yourselves. The objectives for today are firstly to help you understand what the ETI base code is uh, as a human rights uh, standard. Um, secondly, to help you understand what the social audit approach is if you're new to this, to know what you can expect. Uh, thirdly, uh, to review some frameworks for how this information on labor and human rights are shared internationally and to you know, help you look at how you can use that in those frameworks to monitor conditions in your supply chains. And then finally, as I said earlier, we'll cover off any questions that you have on, on best practice. So the Ethical Trading Initiative. Uh, so it's a tripartite body. It has NGOs, companies and trade union representatives gathered around the same table. And they've come together to improve the lives of workers globally and in, you know, in global supply chains. So it represents over £107 billion worth of business. So that is how much. That's how many companies are sat around that table. Uh, the members are all committed to um, monitoring and improving conditions, as I said, based on the ETI base code and local legislation. Um, once those members have drawn up reports, they get taken back to the ETI and their monitoring yearly reports get given over to an NGO who will then feed back on how they're progressing, whether whether they've seen any improvements in their supply chains. And then finally, uh, it's, uh, it's a place where companies and NGOs and trade unions can collaborate on projects. So it's it's difficult as a as a as a company to deal with one issue on your own. It's much better to have a sectorial approach, and the ETI facilitates this uh, meeting area. These are some of the members that sit around the table. So you you can obviously see here as the Sainsbury's, Marks and Spencer's, Tesco's, all the big UK retailers. They're all there. Um, we've also got the clothing uh, manufacturers, we've got uh, Arco, which are safety uh, company, um, you have, you know, Gaming, Bowden, um, again, clothing, and then on the right hand side, you can see Christian Aid, uh, Care International, Oxfam, the Trade Union Congress, so those are the sort of people that are, bit, are sat around the table. The Ethical Trading Initiative base code, as I said, has uh, some key provisions that are brought together through the ILO conventions. So the first of all is the one around forced labor. So the first thing that the code says is that employment is freely chosen. Secondly, it's around the freedom of association and the right to be collect to collective bargaining. So um, there are a lot of companies uh, at the moment that are resisting uh, trade union participation in their operations. So what the ETL base code asks for is uh, for worker committee or worker voice mechanisms to be installed in those uh, companies. Thirdly, that working conditions are safe and hygienic. Um, that's a self-explanatory one. Fourthly, that child labor shall not be used. And again, that mimics the ILO convention and minimum age internationally is 15 years of age. Or what? Or if your local legislation says it should be a higher minimum age, then it's a higher uh, age there. Um, fifthly, that living wages are paid, and it talks about living wage and not necessarily minimum wage because it wants to make sh the ETI base code looks at how much earning potential there is for uh, an employee. So in the UK, for example, we have zero hour contracts. And it might be that a person's not getting enough work to be able to live off that wage. So that's the kind of thing that it refers to there. Working hours are not excessive. So we're talking about a, a, a 48 hour week and a maximum of 60 hours with 12 um, hours uh, added as overtime. Um, two day uh, periods that are off in a 14 day period and then adequate rests given between shifts. 
Um, it looks at discrimination, that no discrimination is practiced. Um, this discrimination is actually one of the ways that we tend to identify uh, people that are at risk of forced labor or modern slavery because they pick out certain groups. So that's a very useful provision. <laughs> Um, regular employment is provided. That's looking at the casualization of workers. So there are um, a lot of companies, for example, that may hire and fire workers on a continuous basis so that they avoid the benefits that have to be that go with that. And then that um, no harsh or inhumane treatment is allowed. So that's the final one. What's in a social audit? Um, so again, you've seen the key questions that we would cover off as auditors, and but but you'll also hear um, auditors talk about the, the triangulation of data. So a social audit is um, a visit to a site by a social auditor who then gets to inspect what the policies, procedures, management practices of a business are against those provisions that we had uh, talked about before. And what we're using as a benchmark is at the ETI base code as an inspiration, you know, aspirational uh, benchmark. But as a minimum, what we're looking for is for uh, companies to meet their local uh, re le legislative requirements. So the triangulation of data involves a site walk around. So you have a visual inspection to see you know, accommodation blocks. If you're in a manufacturing site, you'll be looking at uh, fire exits, um, you know, first aid provisions, the state and security of the building, et cetera. Um, we do worker interviews. So uh, a social audit is really not supposed to last um, uh, less than two days. And that's to give you enough time to get enough of a sample of worker interviews so that you're, you can carry out the interviews, you can get the information that you need, but you're not going to put anybody at risk. And that's why it has, uh, it has a lot of time given over to worker interviews so you can kind of hide the data if you need to. And then finally, um, it's a document check uh, process. So we will look at how hours are recorded, where they're recorded, whether workers are getting paid for those hours, how they're getting paid, how often they're getting paid, uh, whether it's being paid into their direct bank accounts. And then finally, we'll look at worker files. We'll, so we look at what information the company has on the worker or has given the worker. So terms and conditions and contracts are very, very important for us because we want to know that um, workers have been given all of the information about the job and the site where they're working. And then once we've done this investigation, we've done the triangulation of the, day, of the data, we would probably sit down overnight and um, come up with a list of observations about uh, what we think the company is doing either well or could be doing better, but also a list of non-compliances. So if the if the company is not meeting the legislation on the minimum wage, or you know they have excessive working hours that go over you know sixty hours, which is the DTI base code, that would get brought up as a non-compliance. So uh, we will sit down with the management at the end of the two days, and we will give them, you know, talk about the non-compliances and then develop an action plan uh, with identifying each action either as a critical, major or minor issue. And it's we grade those actions so that we can then give it a time frame and prioritize the time frame for those companies to put things right. So, um, yeah, it's a very good way to get an action plan into place. Um, how can you see this data? So some... So the the one framework that is used for companies that are using the ETI base code is uh, SEDEX. So it's a supplier ethical data exchange. It was set up uh, around the year 2003, I think it's yeah 20 years old. And this is an online system where the audits will be uploaded. Um, if a supplier of yours hasn't had an audit, they can also fill out a self-assessment questionnaire to provide their buyers with some information about what they have in place. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the place where we go to to get information on suppliers. And um, it's, it's where that exchange takes place. There's three different types of membership, A, B or C. Um, one suggests that you can be just a supplier and therefore put information into the system. B can mean that you're a, a buyer and you just want to look at the information from your suppliers. 
And then C can be both buyer and supplier at the same time. And it allows you to uh, to gather information from um, across different sources there. So you can be both at the same time. Um, as I say, we upload our reports onto the portal and then uh, companies then use have are given access to these reports and then can use that information to track progress. So the three principal domains uh, that are being checked in a SMETA audit are environmental issues, uh, labour and human rights and business ethics. Uh, I mean, I always include health and safety on the labour. Um, but there are three different um, areas that will be looked at. A lot of companies are still looking at just labour and human rights and business ethics. But as we have new EU legislation coming forth, that uh, is opening much more to environmental performance. So um, here is a little diagram of how uh, SEDEX is used to monitor supplies. So you can see the suppliers update their, they can update their audits and self-assessment questionnaires. And they they are the ones that choose to share these with their clients if this, they so wish, okay? Um, you know, their buyers may request a social audit, but they don't have to give it to them unless it's a condition for trade. So the, the reason that this was designed like this is because you have a lot of buying companies that might be sitting around the table at the Ethical Trading Initiative, and the aim was to reduce the expenditure to suppliers who normally have to pay for the audits and, and then just avoid the duplication of data and the same report getting sent out a hundred times to different uh, buyers. So it, it also allows you to have traceability on labor and human rights in the sectors or countries or products that you're sourcing or services that you're sourcing. Um, the way that it goes with customers is that um, you as a customer, if you're a buyer, you can consult and manage the ethical information for all of your suppliers on one site. So you could very well um, make it a condition of trade with your um, suppliers that you would you would like to adopt the ETI base code and that you would need a social audit from them to see how labor and human rights conditions uh, are being managed. So this means that you can use the platform to identify those risks in the supply chain. And then um, companies with a turnover of over 36 million pounds who have to report against the Modern Slavery Act in the UK at the very least, um, can then use this information to report publicly on what they're seeing as trends in their supply chains. Um, and finally, you can share the report at the Ethical Trading Initiative to have an NGO look over the work that you've done and perhaps give you advice and help you develop a collaborative project. So, grosso modo, that's how it works. In terms of the next steps, if I was completely new to this, um, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, map the supply chains for your products and services. Uh, for any of you that have been to my uh, presentations before, it's normally the number one uh, uh, recommendation that we give. Secondly, um, conduct a, a desk review or a risk assessments of your suppliers. You can either break these down into countries or regions or sectors or industries that you're operating in. Um, thirdly, develop a policy that you can communicate to your suppliers. It's not really fair to spring it upon suppliers that you just want a social audit. You should have some document, some policy that says what you're going to do with that information, what that's going to mean for them as suppliers and how you're going to use the information, et cetera. You know, there might be suppliers will always be worried that there's going to be a commercial um are going to be commercial repercussions so you need to explain what you're going to do with that information once you've got it um then i would just say select a small number of suppliers across the board you can go to different regions or you can do different industries and then um focus on those suppliers with which you have the most trade volume um because you're going you might be in there um asking for things to be um action or things to be changed it might imply an expense for suppliers and if you're not buying a lot from from them it means you don't have much clout unfortunately as hard as that is to say but it, it means it's better if you've got a serious a volume of business going with a supplier to try to get them to improve issues um then you can identify the key risks and then look at other companies that might be operating in that sector to see if you can collaborate and find solutions together. 
Um, the last thing that a social auditor would want is to put um, a supplier at risk. I mean, we don't want to put workers at risk, but we don't want to put a supplier's business at risk either. So the social audit process is really uh, an, a continuous improvement plan. We're not wanting to see perfect immediately. We understand that it might take a, a while to get uh, labor and human rights conditions up to scratch in some of the most um, uh, challenging environments that we, we visit. And then finally, uh, use the information that you found from your social audits to develop training programs, just really simple training programs for your suppliers on the specific issues that they're facing. So it might be that your social audits are picking up lots of problems on health and safety, or it might be that your social audits are picking up lots of problems on the way that hours are being managed. So you might want to develop some training around that and, you know, um, try to have chat in the house rules about and talk to your suppliers about how they might be able to go forward and face some of those challenges.